Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 2022 FinTech Conference, DeFi or DeFi, Mainstreaming Decentralized Finance. And welcome to the NYU Stern FinTech community. I'm Kathleen DeRose, the director of the Fubon Center for Technology, Business, and Innovation, and one of the leaders here of our FinTech programs. We're incredibly proud to have reached thousands of undergrads, MBAs, execs, and alums with our winning FinTech programs. Since its inception in the wellspring of the financial crisis, FinTech has delivered on many of its original promises, and yet it continues to surprise. In 2021, we reached $3 trillion of crypto valuation before the recent correction. Venture capitalists spent tens of billions of dollars, new record highs in FinTech investments. China launched its digital currency at the Beijing Olympics, the first CBDC to go live. JP Morgan announced a 26% increase in its tech budget to 12 billion to defend itself against FinTech. And if you want any further signals of mainstreaming, we've now got the crypto.com sports arena and Coinbase ads at the Super Bowl. Today's conference, DeFi or DeFi, addresses decentralized finance, which operating on a base layer of shared public infrastructure, like Ethereum or other blockchain contenders, promises to further lower the cost of finance and make it more accessible by eliminating intermediaries in governmental and commercial areas. Here are some questions this conference hope, hopes to answer. Will DeFi create, create synchronized, global, interoperable blockchains that coordinate lenders and borrowers and asset buyers and sellers and enable new businesses? Or will DeFi, by phasing out oversight and control, introduce destabilizing opacity and leverage and enabling bad actors? Will DeFi invite diverse new participants in the financial system? Or will it remain the domain of traditional players and incumbents? Will DeFi reaffirm foundational laws of finance or just test the boundaries of regulation and governance? Will DeFi operating via smart contracts, doing automated finance, improve productivity further, or simply continue to be plagued by operational challenges, security and data privacy issues, and lack of scalability. Today, you're gonna to hear firsthand from those on the front lines of academia and entrepreneurship in DeFi and, and FinTech. Our conference, DeFi or DeFi, offers so incredibly much. We have speakers from all over the world, from traditional finance and from startups. We heard, we'll hear today from academic panels on the frontiers of academic research and finance, and you're going to see this in our practitioner groups, startup demos, lunch and networking, opening and closing keynotes, and of course, this incredible diverse audience that we all have together today. Before I begin, I want to thank our founding donor and NYU alum, Richard Tsai, for making the Fubon Center possible. A special sh shout out to our FinTech Advisory Board, and a very, very warm thanks to this year's conference sponsor, Silicon Valley Bank. We really appreciate you. And a warm thanks to, of course, all of our speakers and all of you participants. One quick housekeeping note, for those panels with Q&A, and today that'll be only our academic panels so that we can offer you more content, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. It's now my absolutely huge pleasure to introduce Matt Harris, our opening keynote speaker. Matt began his investing career at Bain in 1995. He serves on numerous nonprofit and for-profit boards. He was one of the pioneering investors in FinTech and more recently in DeFi. And I couldn't think of anyone better equipped to educate us this morning about DeFi. Welcome, Matt Harris. Thank you, Kathleen. I am thrilled to be here in a metaphorical sense. Um, I do look forward to being able to be in person with you all in the future at future events. I've really enjoyed this conference in past years and uh, look forward to coming back many years. Um, one of the reasons I'd prefer to be in person is that my children keep their rabbit in my home office. So if you hear a desperate scratching noise in the background, that's the, that's not me. That's the 15 pound bunny. Um, but we're going to kind of keep, keep together so we can focus on FinTech and DeFi. Um, as a table setter here at the outset of the conference, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the history of innovation and financial services, or what we generally call fintech. Uh, we contextualize DeFi as a chapter in a series of chapters that have really, you know, from my perspective, started in 
2000 and will continue for many decades. And so the first objective here is to just put decentralization in the context of a, a set of seismic changes that have happened in the financial services industry and are happening right now. Um, and then go into detail a little bit about, uh, about DeFi itself and some of the potential futures we see to try to get at a high level at some of those questions that Kathleen was, uh, was speaking to. So I'm going to share some slides. And uh, by the way, if anyone wants these slides, I'm happy to make them available. Um, here we go. So uh, I call this talk a complete revolution. And uh, I'll, I'll get into why. Um, but first, let me share a little bit of backdrop on you know the history of fintech investing as I experienced it. Um, uh, as Kathleen mentioned, I started my career at Bank Capital in 1995, but then uh, I took kind of a left turn and ended up starting my own firm back in the 90s. Bank Capital was really focused exclusively on private equity, and I wanted to do early stage venture capital. So the partners there uh, helped to seed me, started my, uh, there's that rabbit, started my own firm in late 99 and um and then the world fell apart. Uh, sort of, uh, I'm having an eerily familiar feeling these days. Uh, but for those who weren't investing uh, or participating in in business in uh, the middle of 2000, the stock market plummeted, and what had been the dot com boom became the dot com bust. And I was left with a venture firm and no obvious strategy. And for a variety of reasons, uh, I chose fintech. Um, back, as you can see, this, this chart doesn't even go back to 2000, but uh, those zeros were in effect what attracted me to investing in what I used to call innovation and financial services. It was basically an irrelevant sector or non-existent sector of the venture business. And that seemed like uh, the kind of small pond that maybe even a small fish like me could appear big in. So. Um, yeah, that's what I've done ever since. And these, this chart kind of tells the the 22 year history of my career in a sense, which is to say, roughly a flat line for the first decade of my own independent venture career, uh, toiling away in in fintech at a time when nobody really cared about it. Um, I I experienced the turning point in that when Jack Dorsey founded a payments company. Jack Dorsey was already a famous founder in Silicon Valley for having been part of the founding team at Twitter. Um, and so when he turned his attention to payments, it got it really got everyone focused on the opportunities in financial services. And things got much more interesting after that, so much so that in 2012, I decided uh, to go back to Bain Capital on the venture capital side. And, and now I run kind of a stage agnostic fintech practice um, team of eight people. And, and we do everything from pre-seed investing through to growth equity investing all around payments, lending, wealth, and insurance. In 2013, uh, you know, in 2012, I got interested in Bitcoin in a deep way. Personally, my partners thought I was literally insane. Um, but by 2013, I just couldn't keep from, uh, you know, trying to get the fund invested in crypto one way or another. And I was lucky enough to be close with a, a founder named Barry Silbert, um, who was a fintech founder already having founded Second Market and in his own personal account had invested in Coinbase and Ripple and Zappo and their seed rounds and owned a huge amount of Bitcoin. And he agreed to move all of those assets from his personal account into a new company we created um, called Digital Currency Group. And we invested a million dollars for 10% of that. And so for the past nine years, uh, I've been investing from the DCG platform and watching Barry build a, a great set of businesses. Um, but for the first five years, at least, that was really a Bitcoin story. It wasn't until the ICO initial coin offering boom of 2017 that we at Bank Capital started to independently pay attention to the possibilities introduced by Ethereum. And since then, we've been significant investors in DeFi. That was the theme we chose. We were early investors in a company called Basis, which is a story I'll tell a little bit later, and then Maker and Compound, DYDX, UMA, et cetera, all in their initial financing rounds. Um, and then, you know, just last year, we set up a half a billion dollar fund to do protocol and token investing in crypto. So 
that's sort of our story and and the story of fintech over the last 20 years. But let's back out a little bit to some of the themes. Um, I'll call your attention to this 50 three billion dollar number uh it definitely got my attention as somebody who was you know in this uh game back when everything rounded to zero um because you have to ask yourself what are people assuming if they're willing to invest 50 plus billion dollars just in one year under the hopes of earning at a minimum a three times return um and where generally a venture firm or the venture industry might own, you know, 30, 40% of a company at maximum. So if you just play that through, it means that that money invested in one single year expects there to be nearly half a trillion dollars worth of value created, not to mention all the years prior and what's happened in 2022. So that got me thinking that this fintech thing was no longer sort of a corner of financial services, but perhaps represented a complete revolution that fintech, again, was not a, a marginal activity that was set up to the side to think about innovation, but rather represented a wholesale reinvention of payments, lending, insurance, and wealth that could potentially justify that amount of capital and more. And, and so we built a framework that attempted to explain that, which I'll get into here. Um, so the elements we think of this complete revolution don't really come into full fruition, you know, until we're sort of a half century through it. So one of the beauties of this model is that when you give yourself kind of 30 years forward, you know, a lot can go wrong and you can still believe that you might be right at the end of the day. It's a, it's an incredible luxury that I don't usually get in my investing career where things have to, you know, go right a little more quickly than three decades. Um, but there is also the great luxury in zooming out that you can really start to see some meaningful patterns that up close and personal and the granular day to day are less obvious. Um, and so let me talk through the patterns that are represented on this slide. Um, you know, when I lived through the, what I think is the sort of concluding, I would say, first chapter of fintech, it was the same pattern over and over again. It was a, it was a technology-driven founder identifying a product space within financial services, realizing how painful and analog that product experience was both being sold that product, being you know serviced, that is to say, experiencing that product. All of financial services, if you go back to 2000, was um, hideously analog, often conducted in a branch, uh, almost certainly conducted with wet signatures and various other extremely friction-filled aspects of account opening and account management and servicing. Um, and so these founders said, well, look, we can do that digitally. And then eventually we can do that on a mobile app. And so if you think about Square in its first instance was really just merchant acquiring made digital and Lending Club and On Deck and SoFi, again, really just plain vanilla lending products, personal loans, student loans, um, but taken out of an analog and branch context and moved digitally, Lemonade and Root auto insurance, home insurance, et cetera. Again, these are products that have existed in many cases, literally for centuries. And, and this is sort of my central argument in this phase is there was really no innovation that took place. It was truly just a transformation of form rather than substance from analog to digital. And by the way, it worked and it created uh, north of a trillion dollars of equity value just from that transformation. It's perhaps shocking that the incumbents didn't come to that conclusion sooner themselves and participate more in that value creation, but they didn't across that entire landscape of payments, lending, wealth, and insurance. It was an outsider who made the first move. And um, in some cases, the incumbents, as in wealth, Schwab and Vanguard and Fidelity, reacted quickly and were able to retain most of the customers, most of the value relative to the digital upstarts like Wealthfront and, and Betterment, both of which have done and will do quite well, but have not exactly taken you know, meaningful market share. Um, but in certain categories, like digital consumer banking, you have 
really hefty companies. Um, Chime is a good example where they're taking noticeable market share from the incumbent. So a very important chapter, but just the first chapter, because what's happening now, what happened next was that once these products are digital, we can move beyond the, the idea that these are, in fact, discrete products that need to be bought and sold in the way they'd always been bought and sold. Hey, can I offer you a DDA or, excuse me, person uh, you know, scrolling the internet, would you like a personal loan? Uh, even though it's digital, that is still, in an emerging way, an anachronistic way to sell and underwrite and service a customer across the major fields of financial services. The modern way to do it is to offer them products, offer consumers and businesses products in the context of sticky data-rich software that they're already using every day. And so that is this notion of embedded financial services or embedded finance or embedded fintech. Choose your term of art. I prefer embedded financial services because this is the key point. It's no longer fintech. It clearly rests on a chassis of financial technology, but it's the whole enchilada. It is all of financial services over time. I have a sort of arbitrarily and what would look like the second inning of this, but we're not there yet. But to me, it strikes me as now unimpeachably true that all of financial services are better off manufactured, serviced, and sold in the context of software that the end customer is already using. And again, the digitization of all these products makes that possible. Uh, and then, and here, I don't know what pitch of the first inning we're in, but when products are digital and when they're all embedded in software with the UI UX issues solved as it were by the software that contain these products, you can start to think about a broad scale movement from centralized to decentralized. And we are very, you know, frankly, painfully early in that trans transition, but we can see even from where we stand today, the reasons for it and some early signs of it happening. So this is the grand theory, the grand unified theory of um, what would in fact represent a complete revolution. You know, there is, 11, $12 trillion of market cap tied up in financial services companies. And so if all of that is up for grabs through the process of digitization, embedding and decentralization, then you can see why avid venture capitalists are excited to invest $50 billion a year in the incredibly talented entrepreneurs who are making it happen. So let's go into a, a little more detail on some of these themes and, and, and you know, some, some graphics that help to explain a little bit the details of this. You know, I talked through it a little bit, this sort of fintech 1.0 uh, motion of taking something analog and making it digital. And, and it, it produced two different types of very, very interesting companies. Um, the first were the competitors, you know, Venmo competing with checks, Betterment competing with your uh, Edward Jones broker. Uh, JustWorks competing with ADP in, in payroll and benefits. Um, and then there are a set of vendors that emerged um, to help the incumbents compete because the incumbents, again, did not stay in their foxholes forever. Uh, Kathleen mentioned JP Morgan's tech spend ballooning to $15 billion. Now, 53 billion is bigger than 15. Uh, but the fact that JP Morgan alone is spending nearly one third of the entire fintech industry's uh, investment pace is actually extremely notable. Um, obviously, they're not the entire banking industry and banking is not entire the entire financial services industry. So the race is definitely afoot. And part of the Empire Strikes Back motion of these incumbents is to use new vendors and not the vendors that sort of got them there, which is to say, in a laggard position relative to incumbents. Um, but this chapter is decisively over. As you can see here, financial services are digital and all of these statistics are actually pre-COVID. But already, I mean, actually it's shocking to me, frankly, that branches where the majority of, of DDA or checking account openings as recently as 2019. And that is decisively, that battle is over and it's over in lending and it's over in insurance. Um, so that, again, 
the incumbents are well aware of this. Uh, the new players are no longer that new and every consumer and business is used to financial services being digital. Um, the embedded movement represents sort of, to my mind, the latest in a series of, and this is an important idea that we don't have a lot of time to unpack, but latest in a series of um, technology innovations moving from becoming things in and of themselves, business models and businesses and categories to just becoming ingredients. Um, the first that I experienced in my life was in the 90s. The internet went from being a business model to an ingredient. And you went from talking about internet companies to being laughed out of the room, referring to an internet company. And if you follow my strain of thinking, the same is happening to fintech. In 10 years, we're not going to talk about fintech companies. Every software company, every technology company worth its salt will be using payments, lending, insurance, or wealth as an embedded ingredient in their technology business model. Shopify is the most mature version of this. And again, not going to touch every base on this slide so we can get to DeFi. But the fact is they started as a software company and now 70% of their revenue and growing is from financial services across all of these dimensions. So we saw the milepost of where we are, which is to say in the early days of decentralization. Um, and I thought it makes sense to create kind of a word picture of the Bowers, you know, talking about bringing us all back to 2000, 22 years ago, and how archaic these methods seem, some of which, frankly, are, are shockingly still with us, and then paint a picture of a decentralized world in a way that gives us the sense for what the intrinsic motivations are for many market participants to move to that world. And, you know, we think about, uh, we think about money kind of simplistically in these four ways. This doesn't include insurance, uh, particularly the transfer of risk, but, you know, people talk about pools and flows when they talk about money and inflows are, you know, different in many ways for the average consumer for outflows. And then we think of credit as in effect, the time shifting of money. And this is maybe the most dramatic transformation when everything is digital is that much more can be known. Much more can be known about the timing and probability of the inflows and outflows, thereby reducing credit from a mysterious act of predicting propensity to pay to a mathematical act of, yes, predicting, but with much greater accuracy, the likelihood of repayment. When repayment is governed by smart contracts and limited only by the presence of the funds, therefore the ability to pay, that moves from being subjective and highly risky and prone to flaw to moving to something that is objective, incredibly inexpensive to operate. And in, in my mind, again, doesn't exist yet, but in my mind, much less prone to aspects of fraud and credit loss that plague all forms of lending today. Um, so, you know, pools introduces the notion of stable coins. We, as I mentioned, we're the first investor in a, in a company called Basis. Uh, when I say a company, this is our first investment that didn't really involve a company. It was a protocol investment in a token-based system, which, by the way, failed. Um, it failed not because of the founders, who are some of the best founders we've ever worked with, and we've backed them in their next venture, but rather because of regulation, because of, in their case, regulatory uncertainty. Um, and... What mattered back then was that people cared about regulation. The team at Basis sort of did the work, working conscientiously with attorneys and came to the conclusion that an algorithmic stable coin was going to break all sorts of laws here in the United States. And they decided they didn't want to do that. Many, many teams since then have decided they do want to do that. And so one thing to note about DeFi right now is that most of it, if not all of it, is either outside of or in direct contravention of known laws and regulation, um, which is a nervous making field of endeavor uh, for a venture capitalist and, and should be for the participants as well. Um, but the history of innovation and financial services always involves a little bit of transgression of that type. It always involves breaking the rules and then making accommodations for those changing rules as regulators adapt 
to changing technology and changing patterns of behavior. 2022 has already seen regulators take some steps to clarifying what the rules of the road are in ways that have been expensive uh, for certain companies, but amazing for the ecosystem. And our hope is that regulators lean into that motion of clarifying how digital assets should be regulated, traded, um, held, uh, what sort of money transmission and other AML style laws should be applied to these new frameworks for storing and transferring value. Because you can see on the right-hand side that this vision of the future where wealth or you know and i'll talk a little bit more about the various types of pools but as it's being held it's being held by non you know financial institutions non-regulated depositories it's being held outside of the fiat system in many cases in what will look like securities um and will have to therefore have a regulatory framework that govern governs them these underlying constituent elements of the various flavors of stable coins, some of which will be truly stable, other of which will look more like investments. The proliferation of that, of who holds your wallet and what is in your wallet and what denomination is one of the most fascinating things the next few decades are going to bring to bear. And then this inflows and outflows thing. Money movement is among the most regulated activities in our economy after securities law. And when it's governed by smart contracts and tokens, we need to adapt uh, a body of extremely old state-based regulation to these extremely customer-friendly and vitally important new methods for moving money and for offering credit. Credit is you know, probably third on that list of most regulated activities behind securities and money movement. And how do you, how do you regulate, how do you enforce truth in lending on a protocol with no human beings? Who do you go after for violations? What is the consumer protection theory of the case when the lender is a anonymous individual who lives in Singapore and the borrower is uh, doesn't even really know they're borrowing. It just feels like an advance on their paycheck. It feels like a time shifting of money they're due. What is the relationship between those two people as governed by smart contracts and as atomized across tens of thousands of borrowers and tens of thousands of lenders? So I feel very high conviction that that future, whether it's 2050 or sooner, is going to happen. I feel enormous amounts of uncertainty as it relates to how it's going to be governed and by whom. You know, the, the wallets thing I find most fascinating. I mean, I... I know none of us sitting here today feel like, geez, I wish my money was atomized and spread in more places. But the fact is, the limitations on where and how and with whom we keep our money, in what form we keep our money, and what rewards we get for storing our money in any given place are limited, not just by the cognitive load of managing it, which is a thing, but also by the regulatory chassis that governs who can hold money and what advantages they have for holding that money. Um, and the technology, the sort of creaky technology that sits behind a DDA. And even when you have, you know, Chime or Acorns or an elegant mo or current elegant modern DDA, behind it, there's a bank. There's a bank working on a mainframe and there's a regulatory chassis that hasn't been updated in 35 years. And so, that limitation is going to go away when we move from a centralized world governed by regulators, governments, and the financial institutions enthralled to them to one that has question mark regulation, but is most importantly, has no central intermediaries taking rent and is governed by smart contracts and moves at the speed of, you know, the most modern computing chassis instead of mainframes. And so that freedom, and yes, we have to manage the cognitive load of every one of my commercial counterparties offering me a wallet and a loan. You know, think about buy now, pay later. As it is today, Americans borrow more money from more counterparties now than five years ago, simply because every retailer is offering you a loan. 
that points to a future where, again, all of your commercial counterparties in one way or another have a financial value proposition in addition to their commercial value proposition. And it involves storing money and it involves a relationship with you whereby they're rewarding you for storing money there or advancing you money to make a purchase and flipping between those two states as determined by their own capital situation, their own inventory situation, their view of you as a likely high value, low value, medium value customer. Again, all of which managed through software. So the cognitive load matter gets resolved. And that's where the embedded financial services, the fact that commerce and financial services are going to be intermediated through software anyway, is what gives us hope that cognitive load is actually a manageable issue versus a non-starter. We're coming uh, close to the end here, and I want to talk a little bit about implications. Um, I, I'm excited by this first point on the left about governments. Governments have the ability to choose the kind of regime they want to offer their systems. Now, there are constraints. There are lots of stakeholders. We see it today in cities and states with mayors turning from executives to chief marketing officers to recruit a newly mobile citizenry to come pay taxes uh, in their jurisdiction and create jobs in their jurisdiction. It's mind blowing to me that government officials are turning into marketing officers in this way, but it's also perfectly logical. When we're no longer fixed in place by our histories, by our jobs, by our schools over time, we become consumers of government. And the sooner our governments realize this, and globally that governments realize this, and some are realizing it faster than others, the more quickly they will become aware that their policy is towards financial services and decentralization are an incredible plank in that marketing platform. Do they want directionally open systems where yes, there's risk and yes, there will be scammers um, and yes, there will be increased complexity and rapid pace of change. But it is in a sense, sort of the ultimate conclusion uh, hopefully not in a end the book kind of way, but rather in a new plateau kind of way of the capitalist experiment, moving from control and close to open and free and decentralized finance can be the spine of that completed motion. And governments are going to have to choose. And ironically, the US government, which was the, dare I say, leading country in the old fight, between capitalism and communism, I think has yet to decide where it stands on this new fight between a new version of open and a new version of closed. And much of what we're seeing would seem to indicate that openness is no longer, openness and freedom are no longer the chief priorities. Um, so there will be jurisdictions that are in, and jurisdictions that are out. Most jurisdictions will be out. The next couple, three years are gonna be incredibly bumpy for decentralized finance as governments grapple with the consumer protection implications, um, with the market stability implications, and with the impact on the right-hand side on the incumbents. You know, FDIC insurance is one of the last bulwarks that the banking industry has between it and irrelevance. Um, and if there are ways to algorithmically solve for security uh, around where your money is held um, by moving towards stable coins and cryptographically secured trust, then the rationale for 250 to 350 basis points of net interest margin go away. And similarly in insurance, which could be a whole other session, the rationale between the gap between you know, losses and premiums plus uh, returns on invested capital, that is the insurance industry, that margin could go away, replaced by protocols and tokens. Um, so this is an extreme threat for financial institutions, further triggering the fight or flight syndrome for governments whose 
one of whom's job it is clearly is to protect the status quo around financial institutions. So I realize I leave you with more questions than answers. Uh, I myself have more questions than answers, but I am increasingly 100% convinced about the direction of travel, if not about the ETA. Um, and I hope you found these ideas stimulating. Again, thank you, Kathleen, and to the entire NYU community. I'm thrilled to be here again. Oh my gosh. So what an amazing kickoff to this conference. You've, you've indeed raised many exciting questions. Thank you so much, Matt. That's, that was an amazing introduction. Thanks. And now, really good. 